Good evening. Thought I was fixing to have to whip Ryan over there. He tried to take my notes. I couldn't have done it without him. I will. Glad you showed up. <laughs> it's your fault, by the way. It's Will's fault this evening that this might not be very good because he showed me some video I had to watch all day and it, and it just it's got me thinking this way and that way and he kind of did it on purpose, I think. No, I didn't get to golf tonight. Anyway, so here we go. How am I supposed to feel in worship? Most of us feel a great deal is to be gained in worship, but wonder if we've received the benefit there is to be had. Some leave disappointed, maybe even a little hostile, expecting some Hollywood video version production or some funny feeling in their stomach when they leave. Of course, if you don't get out of worship what you hope for, it might not be the fault of the preacher or the song leader. It could be that it's your fault. Think about the Israelites who assumed God's unresponsiveness was due to his being hard of hearing or having short arms. But instead, Isaiah 59 verse 1 through 2 says, The fault lay in their iniquities, separating them from God. Feelings do not determine doctrine. Feelings do not trump the plain teaching of Scripture. Feelings are unreliable. Jeremiah insisted the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Paul added, the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Romans 8, verse 7. So where did we ever get the idea that our feelings were a reliable gauge of what God wants? Better yet, where did we get our feelings are reliable at all? And you can count on this. The most unreliable factor in life is probably going to be your feelings. Feelings are delusive. They're deceptive. The very last thing you want to do is bet your eternal life on your feelings. So what emotions does the Bible speak of? Might not sound like it up to this point, but my suggestion is we should feel something definite and powerful. We shouldn't sit around like a bump on a log, indifferent to the worship that's going on, taking place. Because if indifference is an emotion, it's not one we should feel in our worship to God. So let's go over maybe how we should feel when we worship. I think first we should feel awe and reverence. I think today in this day and age, I think reverence is kind of a lost art. You have you know people texting during funerals, talking during the Lord's Supper with one another. Um, people think we should earn their respect before we're obligated to even give it. I think we should elicit reverence in every encounter. When Isaiah saw God for who he really was, he was stunned into reverent awe. Listen to what he said. Woe is me, for I am lost, he cried out. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. Isaiah 6, verse 5. So no matter what else is happening in worship, whether it be good singing, bad singing, good preaching, bad preaching, always respond in awe and reverence to the incomparable God that we have. I think we should also feel a little bit of remorse for the sins that we commit. I think these days it's popular to talk about celebration. Celebration in church. Celebration. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, some people make worship a, just a, an hour full of, of happiness. Uh, every aspect of it's upbeat, off the walls, off the charts. But I think there's a lot to mourn about. I think there's a great deal to mourn about in worship. I think while we should celebrate what God did at the cross, we might also express remorse for the sin that we did that put him there. David declared that the sacrifices God requires are of a broken and contrite heart. Psalm 51 and 17. The taxpayer of Jesus' parable beat his chest, cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, in Luke 18 and 13. How about humility? Our sinful condition I just mentioned suggests the proper attitude in God's presence should be humility. What did James say? He called us to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift us up. Arrogance in the presence of a mighty God is about as inappropriate as a clown at a funeral. If you leave worship telling everyone how much more sophisticated you are than them, how much more you know than they do, something is wrong. That's not what you're supposed to get out of worship. <laughs> Profound gratitude. When the Israelites returned to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, 
they gathered on the foundations of the new temple and they worshiped God. They sang from Psalms 107, For He is good, His steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Ezra 3 verse 11. Some wept when they recalled Solomon's temple before it was burnt to the ground. Others shouted for joy because of the possibilities of a newly established Israel. How deeply they must have been aware that day that God's love was indeed steadfast. After all, he had not abandoned his people. In our case, too, we celebrate God's patience, his mercy, his son's death on the cross. I don't, if, that, if that doesn't move you, I don't, I don't, not much will. We should feel joy. We all have troubles. Me, I have probably quite a bit more than, than you, y'all do, and I'll admit that. But to me, it's unbelievable of all the people I see sitting here, or I see sitting at church sometimes, and I've never seen smile. They sit with their arms crossed thinking that somebody needs to walk up to them and, and cheer them up, make them smile, make them listen, make them participate. I'm not saying that we're not going to have a little bit of unhappiness in the Christian life. I'm just saying we shouldn't do it day in and day out. Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. That's the profound gratitude. That's what we just talked about. That's the way we should praise Him and, joy, and, and be grateful for His acts of salvation. Finally, a deep determination to do right. Is determination a feeling? Maybe y'all, maybe you think it is, maybe you don't. Well, if it's not, it should be. What else would it be? Isaiah's vision of a holy God ends with a summons to serve. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then he said, Here am I, send me. I think there's always that moment in worship, in every time you come and worship God, that in your heart, you should be asking your question or asking the question to God here I am send me if we fail to worship in this manner don't you think service maybe be a little a little vain maybe a little bit empty see I think worship should bring out deeper feelings than somebody's love for a college football team or a pro football team I think worship draws from us a part of of the human body that, that nothing, no, nothing else can, can draw out of you. I've heard it said you don't have a soul. You are a soul. What you have is a body. I think in worship, God who is spirit is worshipped by our spirit. The part of us that is most deeply human and the part that will live beyond this life. Our bodies might be in a particular GPS location, but our spirit meets God in worship. If there's anything that uh, the church can do for you this evening, if you uh, need the prayers, need the help with anything, please come forward as we stand as we sing. Sweet are the promises.